Joining us now from London is Eritrean activist uh, Vanessa Tsahaya. And uh, here in the studio we have um, Haile Mengistab, who is one of the uh, many uh, Eritrean asylum seekers here in Israel. Uh, Haile, first, your story. We've heard Eritrea, one of the most repressive dictatorships, not just in the world, not just in Africa, but also in the world, a country where political freedom is non-existent, and you're seeking political asylum here in Israel. Why? Uh, it has been now like uh, three decades since the regime, or the repressive and suppressive regime in Eritrea has been involved in destroying communities based on uh, ethnicity, race, and their political inclination. Uh, the indefinite military national service and the forced labor in Eritrea cause innocent nationalists to leave their country where their life will be in a grave danger of organ harvesting. Organ harvesting? Yes. What do you mean uh, by organ harvesting? In Sinai, thousands of Eritreans organs have been harvested by the Arab Bedouins. How? What happens to these people? These people, if they were not able to pay the 30 or 40,000 demanded ransom, when they were under captivity. At the same time, the only chance the Bedouin have is to take their organ and sell it. In the Sinai Desert? Yes. This was until uh, June 2012. And now? And now, because Israel has built its fence on the border with Egypt, no one can sneak into Israel. And the situation back in Eritrea, what specifically were you fleeing from? Uh, I fled Eritrea because I was enslaved inside my country by my own people under the pretext of military national service. So, so this is a point I want to understand because you claim asylum here in Israel uh, saying you're running away from military service and of course this is a country that has conscription so people might raise an eyebrow when you say you're claiming asylum from military service as if it's draft dodging. What is this national service in Eritrea because it's not like the, the two and a half years that uh, people do here in the army is it? In the first place we need to know that uh, the military national service in Eritrea is open-ended was the interminable military national service. Open-ended and interminable. Yes. National service went for decades in which the people get enslaved by the same regime, the same ideology, the same policy. But by open-ended, you mean it has no end date? It has no end date. Unlike here in Israel, women, they serve two years and men three years. Uh, so you go, you go into the army and you can just be kept indefinitely doing what? As long as you are healthy and strong, you can stay in the army. Doing or what? Doing construction, government-based, uh, owned construction building, uh, agricultural works, uh, and also to, uh, to keep or to safeguard the border with Sudan and Ethiopia, because there was the last 20 years, the regime in Eritrea has deceived nationals, Wayane, which means the Ethiopian, will start one day war, so they need to keep all this uh, military conscript uh, for two decades. So an open-ended military service, which really is a system of mass-enforced uh, labor and, uh, uh, and slavery. Vanessa, let's go to you in London. You're, you're keeping up the uh, Eritrean the human rights struggle from London. Tell us a little bit about your cause and what you're fighting for. Um, so I got involved because my uncle's a journalist has been unjustly imprisoned in Eritrea since 2001. And 2001 was the year that the European government decided to shut down the free press, um, you know, gather the national parliament for the last time, and officially become a dictatorship. And this national service program that is being discussed is not just only um, indefinite, it is also completely outside the scope of any kind of law. Um, so any kind of abuse that occur on a regular, almost, um, almost all the time, is never, you know, no one's ever held accountable because of this. So. The people are not only working indefinitely, but they're being victims of a kind of abuse that is never uh, being brought into a court or any kind of justice or legal mechanism. So tell us about your uncle's case then. When was the last time you saw him? What's his condition? What prospect does he have uh, of release? Um, so the last time anyone saw him was on uh, September 21st, 2001. Um, and that was the day that he was taken from his home and put in a prison in the capital city. Um, he's a journalist who's been working, uh, he was a war photogra photographer during the um, War of Independence and worked 
with state media first, but then became a freelance journalist, focusing on the well-being of the Eritrean people. Um, eventually, the government saw his work and his you know, passion for the Eritrean people as a threat to their power. Um, and he was imprisoned alongside other journalists, politicians, who also were considered a threat to the, government, uh, to the power of the government. No, and they were all imprisoned between the 18th of September and the 21st, and no one has seen them, spoken to them, um, or we barely know if they're even alive. Uh, Hala, let's, let's bring you into this conversation. From when you were in Eritrea, okay, there's no national press, but how much freedom does the individual citizen have to criticize the government out loud? I mean, is this sort of a, a North Korean style dictatorship where people are afraid in private conversations of being critical of the government, or, or how much freedom of, freedom of thought do people have? Uh, until uh, September 2001, there were uh, independent media outlets or uh, newspapers that. Uh, uh, that I can mention, like Satit, uh, Zaman. And when the uh, Eritrean government starts to arrest all the uh, half of the uh, government or the cabinet ministers, immediately they uh, stop or they uh, close all the uh, newspapers. Uh, they, in short, the Eritreans have no right to express their opinion or their uh, feelings at all. They are under the regime interest. Everybody has to stay there. Oh, oh. Vanessa, let's take a look at the international angle since uh, you're speaking to us from London. The UN a Commission of Inquiry in 2016 wrote this in its report. It said, the Commission has reasonable grounds to believe that crimes against humanity, namely enslavement, imprisonment, enforced disappearance, torture, and other inhumane acts, persecution, rape, and murder, have been committed in Eritrea since 1991, also concluding in a Human Rights Council report that the Eritrean government had made no effort to address chronic human rights abuses. What is the international community doing in order to hold the Eritrean government to account given those damning findings? I mean, the international community is very split. Um, there is, on one side of it, a lot of, a lot of us individuals, a part of the diaspora, concerned individuals outside of the Eritrean community, pressing, 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 pressing for change um, in Eritrea, for change for the Eritrean people. On the other hand, uh, there's a huge exodus of Eritrean refugees leaving the country, and governments all over the world are doing what they can to push them back. Um, I mean, the European Union is doing everything in their power to make sure that Eritrean refugees aren't coming to their shores. The Israeli government is doing everything in their power to make sure that Eritrean people cannot seek asylum, and if they do, they're trying to push them back to other third-party countries or back to their home country. So the international community is concerned with their own um, difficulties with handling or their own refusal, refusal to handle these refugees and are therefore kind of ignoring the problems that are going on. Um, instead, there, a lot of them are claiming, including the European Union, that what's going on in Eritrea is economical development problems rather than systematic human rights abuses and are choosing to ignore um, the fact that even the UN now has come out came out with this report that a lot of us have been pressing for these issues for a very long time. And Hila, you've experienced the asylum system from up close. Tell us, how has your case been handled by the Israeli authorities? Uh, upon my early arrival to Israel, uh, I was active in organizing uh, Eritrean refugees to stand for their right. Uh, after so many ordeals or difficult experience they have passed due to the interference of the Eritrean diplomatic mission in Tel Aviv, and also the people from the right wing who don't want us to get organized. Uh, and we start to enhance our capacity, how we can uh, reunion ourselves and stand for our right here in Israel. Uh, many of the asylum seekers have been rejected out of hand, right out of hand. Because uh, what do you mean out of hand? Uh, they don't give them reappeal or just immediately after Holot, whenever they transfer to Holot for one so The year. desert detention facility. Yes. Uh, and immediately their case has been rejected without any reappeal or hiring a lawyer or going to other procedures, except uh, the government has been discussing how they can expel a uh, number of uh, unwanted migrants to refugee absorbing African countries like Rwanda, Uganda, and recently with uh, Chad Idris Deby. A uh, number of things has, has been Working yes, now. there had been an agreement with the United Nations to move half of the asylum seekers to Rwanda and, and to Uganda, and then the Israeli government was backtracked on that. Uh, Vanessa, briefly, uh, if I had to ask you to play devil's advocate, what is the reason that the Eritrean government uses this repression? Is it sadism, neglect, a political, a de deliberate political tool? What, what's the reason for it? 
power. Um, without the people, uh, they know that if the people are free, that they will, won't be able to stay in power any longer. The people want uh, democracy. The people want to be able to rule by their own uh, desires, their own, their own dreams. And by controlling the people, it's not just in their minds, but it's in their actual labor, in their actual work. Um, they decide what they're going to study, if they're going to study, what they're going to work with. Um, and it's easy uh, as a government to be able to survive when the people are working almost for free, when the people are not able to speak up against them, when the people are not able to be um, in opposition to their power. So this is all about power. Vanessa Tahaya in uh, London. Hi, Lemangis, up here in Tel Aviv.